Okay, so we are going to start now, and please welcome, let's see, Alexandra. Hey. Is this working? Very good. Hang on just a second. Moving some debris around up here. Oh, I'm going to be one of these strange people that don't have slides for you because I worked for 13 years in the Department of Defense. And those of you who have been DOD adjacent will understand, I have seen a 116-slide PowerPoint brief. <laughs> and because of that, I cannot, when I have the ability to not inflict that upon you, I cannot not seize that opportunity. So I'm going to be speaking free form. And for those of you who've looked at my bio, my bio is a little nebulous that was supplied for this. And there, there's a reason for that because I was in the intelligence community for 13 years. So these things happen. Um, what I'm going to be talking about is on this theme of making the complex simple and IA for good. I have never been an information architect or anything adjacent to that by way of profession. I was an intelligence analyst. I was a leader of intelligence analysts. I am also a recovering lawyer. I will be speaking, it's a lifelong process. So I will be talking about making the complex simple, but not too simple in that world. I'm also a transgender woman. So I will also, thank you, it's just, I, I it just kind of happened. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, but I'll be talking about that also in the context of making the complex simple and somewhat indirectly for good too because I did that while I was an intelligence analyst. Well, didn't do it, I transitioned while serving as an intelligence analyst in 2006, which was an interesting time to do that. So I will be speaking about those experiences in, succe in succession in the course of the talk. A little bit more story first before we sort of leap in. We talked about 9-11 already. You didn't know we'd be talking about it again so soon, <laughs> but we are. Um, so on 9-11, I happened to be living in New York City. I was in law school. This is the recovering lawyer bit. And my then girlfriend who had asked me to homecoming, then girlfriend, now wife, was in a subway train under lower Manhattan when the towers came down. And I spent three hours pacing furiously in our little Brooklyn Heights studio apartment, not knowing if she was alive or dead. And for three hours, I kind of bargained with God, the universe, anyone listening, just please bring her back. It was also the seventh anniversary of my father's death. So it's just like, this cannot be. Um, but then she, she called me from a pay phone because we had those back then, and she did not have a cell phone. And I kept my end of the bargain, which is why I joined the intelligence community. And having done that, I came into the intelligence community in 2004. Security clearances and everything takes a while. It's important to say 2004, because the work that I did was mostly weapons of mass destruction intelligence analysis. So by 2004, Iraq WMD was already in the rearview mirror. So issues in terms of trust in the analysis that one provides, engendering trust with our decision makers, with the American people, with our allies, all of that was really front and center by the time that I got there. And I make that timestamp too because of the fact that this being 2004, we're also talking politically about a rather different time, socially at a very different time, which also comes to bear in terms of my own story in that I transitioned on the job in 2006, only two years into this. So now I'm going to, you see, I have little notes and slides for myself, but I'm not gonna, again, I'm not gonna make it painful for you. The, what we're gonna talk about first is the gender transition bit, because so much of my intelligence career was actually after I transitioned, and that's where I had more of an ability to influence how we delivered information to our decision makers and how we packaged it. And I'm gonna actually pick up on some of the themes that Margot brought up in terms of, you wanna make the complex simple, but sometimes 
you really need to have those speed bumps because you really don't want to go to a decision maker and say, oh, yeah, yeah, it's easy. It's a slam dunk because we had just dealt with that. So I, I'll get to that a little bit later. This, this is the gender bit. Now, when, when we think about gender, I mean, it bundles up so many assumptions. And particularly, again, rewind 11 years, just the experiences of a lifetime in terms of how you sort and wireframe what it means to be male, what it means to be female. So when you come out, you're not only introducing new data that, oh, this person that you had in this box is not in fact in the box that you expected, but it's a whole new construct of, okay, you're moving from one box to another. Now this is particularly interesting in a very conservative environment because when one comes out in a personal life context with friends, with neighbors, with colleagues in most industries these days, it's often done with storytelling and appeals to emotion and shared connection. You know, don't, have you always just felt like a woman, right? Somewhere deep inside? Okay, well, I feel that way too. And that's just how it has been. And now I am making myself congruent with that. And then you talk about when you started to realize that what's going to come next in terms of, well, at this point, I will start using these pronouns, and at this point, I will do this, and at this point, I will do that. And that's how that is often done in our personal lives. But when you are doing this, not only in the intelligence community, but a military organization within the intelligence community, because I specifically worked for the Office of Naval Intelligence, to do it successfully, at least I found, your mileage may vary should you ever choose to gender transition in the intelligence community. Um, it could happen. Um, was to try to model my storytelling after the environment that we were in and the kind of shared experiences and the ways of taking in information. The first thing that happened was when I started to talk to coworkers about it and to try to inject a little levity but also a little bit of the seriousness that was needed to address this. In, in the intelligence community, we have things that are called compartments. We talk about sensitive compartmentalized information, SCI. I came to call this compartment T, T for transgender. And I, I, that way I could even have just a little shorthand talking to a few people in the office about things because I worked North Korea, among other issues. So it would stand to reason that sometimes on the team I could say, yeah, yeah, and I, I need to talk to you a little bit later about compartment T. So then that way, if someone overheard something, it would not be absolutely crazy that, oh, I, I guess she's just read into something that I'm not. So these are strategies that I employed. But then what also happened was when it came time to talk to the leadership about it, this was not a place where one would simply do the, well, this is how I felt, and this is how it's been, and this is, no, no, no. We, what I did was come up with what we call an information memo within the Pentagon with a POA and M of plans of actions and milestones, which would discuss what was exactly going to happen and when and how we were going to organize it and all of that. We, when it was time to talk to coworkers about it, we, had an invitation to a special read-in, which is, again, what you do when you are going to get access to new sensitive compartmentalized information or other special access programs, except the read-in was all about me. And what we did was in that room, we had, as happens sometimes, numbered copies of a letter that was put on every person's little kind of placemat. So people coming in, it's, oh, okay, it's one of these things. And you know, just kind of, oh, this isn't about WMD at all. Um, this is about something else rather different. But what we did was we still structured it after just a little bit of brief narrative in the very way that we would talk about intelligence information. That, okay, here's the information. Now, how are we going to protect it? This is 2006. One of the only ways that I was able to make this transition work was an understanding that I don't want this to be public 
you, chain of command, do not want this to be public. I just want to keep doing my job. So we're not going to have any reporters know about this. We're not going to do anything like that. So protecting it just like we would protect any analysis against any target that we were dealing with. So again, we're putting it in a structure that people are familiar with. Then we talk about how it will be shared. Again, just like we would do with intelligence that we would have on certain targets or certain issues when it comes to allies, we talk about releasability a lot in the intelligence community. So it would be a matter of, well, how much is releasable to which organizations, which partners, what do we do with our foreign partners? What do we do with the political appointees that we're briefing in the Pentagon? Who gets to tell them and when and how? And what does that look like? Who prepares the brief for that? And laying all of that out in detail. This is one of those times where we talk about levels of detail. This was the exhaustive detail to reassure that everything was handled, no room for ambiguity or error. And then it was finally about how standard operating procedures would be changed, just like when does email get changed? When does my nameplate get changed? When do you start calling me what and when? And all of that. Story, feelings, what you generally hear about in now numerous TV programs about the transition moment and all that, not so much. Even, even in workplaces, that's generally done, but not in this. It was compartment T. So that is for the moment. We'll, we'll come back to it a little bit later, but that's what I would impart with you about what it's like to transition one's gender in the intelligence community. Now, something, again, on a theme of things that you might not generally have access to, which is why I'll be leaving room for some questions at the end, is, all right, I've transitioned. It went well. Now I'm an analyst, having transitioned in the intelligence community, and fortunately, I got promoted several times. And by 2011, I was a division chief in the intelligence community, so I had the ability to change what our product lines looked like, how we disseminated information and analysis to customers. And this is now along the themes of some of what Margot and others have been talking about, where one has authority to make these changes. What are some of the issues that I found? Things that worked, things that didn't work, such as, I mean, you may or may not ever be working with the intelligence community, but there are interesting themes, I think, to tease out here in terms of when you need to make the complex simple, but not too simple, and how to meet vastly different customer needs all at once while still remaining as consistent as possible because we need to engender trust. Now, it's important to understand first that speaking at an unclassified level, there will be times where I'll have to be a little nebulous. I apologize for that. I'll do the best that I can. My work in weapons of mass destruction analysis and leading it, it was because I worked for Naval Intelligence, it was about the transportation of such materials by sea. And this has actually been in the news as recently as yesterday. There were sanctions placed against a number of Chinese, Singaporean, and other shipping companies and entities that had been implicated in helping North Korea generate revenue that could then be used for its weapons mass destruction program. That's along the lines of the work that I used to do. So on one hand, it's weapons of mass destruction analysis, trying to prevent North Korea gaining money for its programs, trying to prevent them from exporting technology or materials to countries that are trying to build their own programs. And yet, it was in the intelligence world and to some of our customers, incredibly uninteresting. And here's why. Because a lot of how that happens is little, rusty, decrepit, barely functioning merchant ships and how they move boxes, containers like you see in ports all over the world from A to B to C. And if you're a decision maker, whether a political decision maker like in the Defense Department, in the State Department, in the White House, or if you're a military commander, you've got well, I'm gonna tell you all about the motor vessel such and such, which is now outside of port this, or you're dealing with 
we have to decide whether we're bombing Libya. You know, it, it just, one has a bit more immediacy and relevance immediately. You know, it's like, I have things to tell you about containers. I have things to tell you about troops massing. So as unexpected as it might be, we would have to compete to some extent to punch through in that environment where we have information we know decision makers need to know. And yet, again, to some of what Margot brought up, we're competing with other immediate events and we're competing with other information sources because though the intelligence community has certain accesses, at the same time, there are countless think tanks. There's The Guardian, there's The Washington Post and The New York Times and many other ways that one can get information. Granted, not so much about containers moving around the world, but experts of varying levels of actual expertise on weapons of mass destruction issues. So we would see that as competition that we would have to deal with. So what we would try to do is think about these different customers and their different predilections and how to enmesh ourselves in their processes in a way that we could punch through and make what we're trying to share more relevant, more usable, simple, but not too simple. So this was naval intelligence. So a number of our customers were naval officers around the world, particularly fleet intelligence watches and fleet watches at various places around the world. So they are dealing with foreign navies and exercises and things like that. And what we did, sorry, I'm just having to realize, skip ahead here, is think about those watches and what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. Ooh, this is kind of appropriate that the lights are going out there because watches are often very dark. You get the big, big screens with big maps in it. So it's, for you in the back, it's kind of atmospheric. And I, if any of you have seen the movie War Games, some of those watch floors are as cool as that, but most really aren't. I'm sorry to say. Um, I, I grew up with that, and I was kind of disappointed when I went to a lot of them. Um, but I had worked on a watch, and one of the things that you deal with on a watch is something called a pass-down, where you prepare a list of all the things that the next watch needs to know. And this is like the, the, the Bible, if you're a religious person, about like, okay, it's one in the morning, you've barely slept, you've come in, I, I need to just cling to these elements of information to guide me as I lumber through this overnight watch and try not to get anybody killed. And what I realized is we could construct our own product line that we would call a pass down, that we could have in parallel to what those watches had, and that that would be a, oh, it's a pass down. That's important. This means it's something that I need to care about. So we built a product line called a pass down. And that then contained this meta message of whatever stuff we're saying here about transportation logistics and things like that, really, this is important. It's a pass down. And it's got a seal on it, you know? So really, it's, it's important. It's official. It's from Washington, you know? And it worked. It worked really well. We, we found that we were able to get more engagement in a two-way um, sort that was valuable to us and that there was more collaboration and without going into places that I can't go. The fact that you have watches around the world that actually care more about the issues that you're studying here and you're trying to prevent, again, IA for good, trying to prevent negative consequences in terms of states unfriendly to us having their WMD programs improve, that, that all improved over time. But we still had some barriers because that's all very good, well and good, these pass downs for these watches. But what about people on ships? What about people deployed? Sorry, what? Okay, cool, we're almost there. Um, what, we, what we dealt with there was, okay, they have targets. They're interested in targets. What can we do that's like 
target related. And because sometimes these are naval aviators and they've, they've gone on missions and they like, draw little planes that you know they've kind of collected over time from their missions. So someone came up with the idea, what about something like baseball cards? So we developed these kind of cards about these issues, and that's what we just, the nomenclature we call them, baseball cards. And it was the issues of a shipment or an activity or an issue that we really needed you to pay attention to. And it worked extremely well for us. And then the final bit in the intelligence community, and then I'll close with um, what I've been doing since, is when we're dealing with diplomats, diplomats and national decision makers. And what we did there is basically a bit of you know, errant plagiarism, where it was you would, as a diplomat, when you go to another government, it's what you do is called you demarche another government when you say the United States hereby disapproves of this terrible thing that you're doing and haven't you signed all these treaties saying that you hate WMD just like we do? Well, come on, do something about it. So we would take the format of one of those and basically reverse engineer back from that with language about analytic integrity and why we felt certain things about certain issues, well, not felt, but had assessed. And we found that that, which we learned by in having some of our personnel study day to day how some of our diplomatic colleagues went about their jobs, this was a way for us to improve our ability to reach them. Now, that's lessons from the intelligence world. We, we talked earlier, well, Brian mentioned earlier about how, how things could get political. Well, this is where, where things do get a little political for a moment because possibly the least interesting thing about me is that I'm currently running for Congress. And <laughs> wow, Congress is getting applause? I didn't think that happened anymore. Um, seriously. Well, changing Congress, all right, yeah. So I'm, I'm running for an open seat in Congress in North Central Massachusetts. You can talk, about me, talk to me about that later, should you wish. Um, but what I've learned since then is fascinating because in doing that, again, you're dealing with now a very different set of customers. It's called the American people and your constituents and your voters. And I've gone from talking about intelligence analysis with all this analytic integrity and everything wrapped up into it and sort of feeling that when I'm talking to people, they see the seal of the group, the division that I lead. Now I'm a politician and therefore everything that I say is immediately suspect. And it's quite a big change all at once. Some of my strategies for dealing with it have actually come back from Intel world because it's about being rigorous about sourcing. It's about analytic integrity. So I don't go around making wild claims about what I can do, what I can change, and all of that because I know from Intel world what happens with that. What I've also seen is how much as with the Intel community after 2004 with WMD, now between 2016 election and other things, all the conventional wisdom that a lot of kind of political consultants will tell politicians has changed very rapidly. We've, a lot of us have grown up with the stories where a politician will be speaking to an audience and say, now, I want to tell you a story about a friend of mine. Her name is Mildred Hazel Thorpton. She's 95 years old. And here are the challenges. And that's what happens. And it doesn't work anymore because it's an immediately a cue. Oh, we're going into formulaic political talk. So you can then try to go the other way. And with certain audiences say, here are my very, very, very well-sourced facts. And I've got all the data for you. And it's all perfectly mapped out. And there are people that respond to that. But there aren't too many. Now, I, I do that with some audiences, but not, not too many. What I'm finding that's working, and some of my, my new colleagues that are running for office in different places around the country, gosh, it's so weird, um, talking about things in terms of nature and other just very basic shared experiences. Like when we talk about, say, okay, we need transportation infrastructure so that then people will be able to get to better jobs and better places, you'll connect to communities, you talk about things like in terms of ecosystems. You talk about life cycles. You try, to, you try to create pictures for people that they can grab onto because 
even people of varying different political stripes can understand some of those very basic core things. You can't ignore the fact that like, if there are weeds growing somewhere, that that's not gonna be good for the plants that you're growing. I mean, really, it seems so cliche and simple, but it, it actually is working in a lot of places. So it's, it's just something that, again, to some of what Margot was talking about, about how we're in this realm where things are being turned upside down very quickly. I've seen it happen now in intelligence world, in my lived experience when it comes to transition, which is a different experience. Sadly, now it's kind of, there's been a backlash and it's harder once again in many ways, and now in politics. So I, what I would share with you is this, that even, even in unfamiliar turf to many of you, whether it's the intelligence world and you know the, the whole deep state that that involves, gender transition, et cetera, many of the themes that you're dealing with in your companies and in other fora, it, it's there too. And people that are not at all practitioners are struggling through it as best as they can. And I, I would welcome any questions with any little bit of time we've got left. Otherwise, find me during a break. I'll, I'll be around. And thank you very, very much. Okay, so I think we are at time for the people watching online and stuff like that, but I wouldn't mind hearing a question or two if, if that's cool with you guys. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Consensus, awesome. Mike goes back on. <laughs> Any questions? questions. Mine is a comment. Please. Thank you, thank you. That's very kind of you. There is a hand for, yes? I have strong feelings about that. Oh, uh, yes. How do I feel about people without security clearances having access to all kinds of terrifying information in the White House? I started applying to intelligence agencies soon after 9-11, 2001. I didn't show up until 2004. Um, there are rigorous processes in place for a reason. And when they're not being used, that is dangerous for all of us. That's... That's my feeling on the matter. Other questions? Oh, I'm, yes. Thank you for the assist there. Please. Yeah. Right. No, thank you. I didn't get to flesh this out as much as I wanted to. Um, all right, yes. So with the pass down that I talked about, did I tell customers absolutely everything in that? No, that, um, that they needed to know, or how did you kind of prune it? You know, what would you select? Yeah, the way we always constructed it was very much in a, this is enough to show that this is important. This is enough to show whether we need you to do something or we need you to not do something. And then... Finally, click here or call this person to find out more about this. And then in some cases, here are conditions, kind of A, B, C. If this starts to happen, do this. If this starts to happen, don't do that. Call this person. Um, that's, that's what we did. All right. I think... Yeah. Um, find me afterwards. Let's, let's hear another round of applause.